One of the striking things for me always about that chapter was the extraordinarily precise mathematical logic of it. Um, I mean, it comes closest to a mathematical dialectic. And yet, and, 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 and sometimes uh, that ability and that, that way of right. working is, is why Marx gets tagged as, in some ways, a structuralist with, a without, or a positivist even, yes. without people in the equation and so on. Yes. But of course, by the time you move on to chapter 10, the working day, um, yes. the limits of that kind of analysis uh, become obvious and you see Marx's own method deriving. So at some point he says, you know, if you've got equal rights, the right of the labourer to sell mm. the, the labour power, the right of the employer to employ that labour power between equal rights, force decides. Um, so what's the shift you see and what's the value of that whole discussion of the working day of, of I think, yeah. wages and of time? Well, I think, I think uh, that's where he really does connect the idea that uh, value is about uh, socially necessary labor time, right. and therefore time becomes crucial. So this chapter is about time. I mean, he says kind of moments are the elements of profit, and therefore attempting to capture other people's time becomes fundamental to what capitalism is about. And here we get into something which is, I think, very interesting because we often think of time as a natural phenomenon. It's there, you know. But what Marx is showing us is that time actually shifts with the dynamics of a capitalist system, that capitalism creates a particular sense of time. It creates the idea of a working day, of a working week, of a working year, of a working life. It creates that idea so that actually that notion of temporality is something which is socially constructed, for instance. Uh, and, and, and this social construction of, 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 of time suddenly says that time is not natural at all. We're being told what time is and all this stuff about, you know, clocking in and clocking mm -hmm. out, uh, the system of fines if you come too late uh, because you, you've offended against the temporal regime. So he's, there's a lot in there which is about the temporal disciplining of a society and a little bit about spatiality because a lot of this goes on inside of the factory. So, right. so it's inside of the factory where this is going on and the, the bells, uh, you know, and I'm, I often think about this is strange. Uh, why is it that universities, for example, have a kind of factory regime? The bell rings and you say, okay, the, this period of uh, the math class is over, I now have to go and do my French for another hour. And so the, 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 the temporal regime of the university is very much uh, of, that, of that sort. And education into time discipline becomes crucial. And, and, and even at the educational level, I mean, I remember um, at some point or other there was this usual thing about uh, the, the deficiencies of university education in teaching first-year students. So we get these people who come down to Harvard, to Johns Hopkins, to tell us what to do. And what do they tell us? They say the thing you should do in the first year of a student's life at university is you have to teach them time discipline. That is the most important thing. And how do you do that? You set them papers and you don't accept the papers if they're late. <laughs> you know? Now, this is intellectual production. Now, you and I know <laughs> that, that you cannot produce work in that kind of way. And, and in fact, there's a very funny, I always had this on my, my desk for, for a long time, very funny letter to Karl Marx uh, from his publisher in Leipzig, yeah, where, 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 where the publisher says, to, Dear Herr Doctor Professor, it comes to our attention that you're six months late with the manuscript of Das Kapital. Uh, if we do not receive the text within the next six months, we'll have to commission somebody else to write it. <laughs> You know. But the point here is that the, the, the chapter on the working day is really about why capitalism has this kind of temporality, which is radically different from pre-capitalist societies, how they organize time, and one would hope radically different from how a socialist society would organize time. But the temporality is, is really fiercely fixed under capitalism, and it speeds up. It goes faster. So 
later on in capital we see this phenomenon of speed up intensification and why capitalism is always about that so we understand something about the logic of the system the logic of its temporalities uh, from that chapter which is one of the reasons I think it's such a fantastic chapter going to do chapter 10 and 11. Chapter 10, The Working Day. And uh, I've commented before on the fact that Marx changes styles throughout Capital. And this chapter is really constructed in a different kind of way than the chapters before. It's full of historical detail and information. Uh, it invokes a whole bunch of uh, theoretical categories that we have not encountered in the text so far, because I think what Marx is interested in doing here is outlining a real historical situation and narrative that both sheds light upon the fundamental theoretical apparatus that he's constructed, i.e. the theory of value, at the same time as you see how the theory of value illuminates something about the history. Now we've discussed before uh, the, the relationship between history and theory in this, in this text, and this is a good chapter to reflect a little bit upon how it works, but it's clear that the history that you're going to look at is a history which uh, involves a lot of things which are not yet in the theory. Uh, if you want them all, to be in the theory, then you've got to get to the end of Volume 3 of Capital and even go beyond, but here is invoking them because he wants to tell a real historical story. And the real historical story is about the history of the struggle over the length of the working day. And he starts off reminding us, and I think this is always very important to do, to remind yourself, about the distinction between the labor theory of value and the value of labor power. The value of labor power is the value of a commodity. It's a commodity in some respects like other commodities, but in other respects, as we've seen earlier, different from normal run of commodities because it, 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 it encapsulates a historical, moral, civilizational element, and as we will see in this chapter, those questions about what is civilizational and what is not uh, come back into the picture. But having said that, he's then kind of interested in the distinction and the difference between what labor produces, the value it produces, and what the value of that labor power is. And so he sets up this simple diagram at the beginning that says, all right, there is a fixed level of the working day, and, or rather, there's a fixed value of labor power, and that fixed labor of, value of labor power is recorded in the number of hours which are required to reprodu reproduce the equivalent of the value of the laborer, of, of that labor power. So, that is fixed, and as he said earlier when he was discussing the value of labor power, we know in practice it varies a great deal depending upon which country you're in and what the historical moment is, and the degree of civilization in a country and the nature of class struggle and all the rest of it, but at a given particular situation we know what it is. So we know what it is, and labor works that length, which is going to reproduce its labor power, and then more, and that is the surplus. And the big question is how much more? How many hours more than that fixed amount that's required to reproduce the value of labor power? And this is something which is not negotiable through normal market exchange practices. It is something which is actually set up in a way which is conflictual. And so he sets up a, a conversation between the capitalist and the laborer. And the question is asked of the capitalist, what is a normal working day? And the capitalist says, well, 
the working day should be as long as possible because I am buying this commodity, labour power, and I have a right to it for as long as I want. And I am therefore going to insist upon my rights, and I'm going to say, I want as much of this as I can possibly get. But of course there are certain limits, so Marx immediately says, well, there's a fluid element here, but there are obviously limits. One is the physical limits to labour power, you can't go more than 24 hours a day, and, well, you've got to have less than that for purely physical reasons, uh, but then there are social limits, and he introduces at the bottom, the worker needs time in which to satisfy his intellectual and social requirements, and the extent and the number of these requirements is conditioned by the general level of civilization. You remember that kind of civilizational thing in the value of labour power also, so this civilizational element comes in. So he says, the length of the working day therefore fluctuates within boundaries both physical and social. But these limiting conditions are of a very elastic nature. On the next page, 342, he says, so capitalist has his own views. As a capitalist, remember, he is only capital personified, his soul is the soul of capital. Again, this is Marx dealing with roles, not people. But capital has one sole driving force, the drive to valorize itself to create surplus value. So capital is dead labour, which vampire-like, and we're going to get lots of vampires and werewolves and all those other kinds of persona introduced into Marx's account here, is vampire-like, lives only by sucking living labour, and lives the more, the more labour it sucks. The time during which the worker works is the time during which the capitalist consumes the labour power he has brought, bought from him. If the worker consumes his disposable labour time for himself, he robs the capitalist. The capitalist therefore takes his stand on the law of commodity exchange. He extracts, he seeks to extract the maximum possible benefit from the use value of his commodity, as anybody would. Suddenly, however, there arises the voice of the worker, and what the wor worker says is this. Well, you can try to extract as much as you can, but what happens if that shortens my working life? I don't think that's fair. I think there should be a length of working day that does not shorten my working, my, my, my life. And so, in this conversation, the worker also takes a, a position which is based upon the law of exchanges. Now, this is interesting, because Marx is not talking here about the the lack of validity of the exchange process, he's saying, all right, we assume, both sides assume, the exchange system is okay, and it is fair, equality against equality. Now we have, this, however, the situation of how much use value the labour is going to give up. And he says that he considers, the worker says, I consider this to be against the laws of contract, and the law of commodity exchange, if you shorten my working life. And the result of this is, on 344, he says the, the capitalist maintains his rights as a purchaser when he tries to make the working day as long as possible, and where possible to make two working days out of one. On the other hand, the peculiar nature of the commodity sold implies a limit to its consumption by the purchaser and the worker maintains his right as a seller when he wishes to reduce the working day to a particular normal length. There is here, therefore, an antinomy of right against right, both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchange. Between equal rights, force decides. Hence, in the history of capitalist production, the establishment of a norm for the working day presents itself as a struggle over the limits of that day, the struggle between collective capital, i.e. the class of capitalist, and collective labour, i.e. the working class. So finally, on page 344, we get class struggle. Yay! We're there. But there are some interesting things about this argument. First is that Marx considers this a battle between equal rights, and it's a force relation. And as, the role, as, a, as a result of this, Marx is actually very sceptical about rights talk. You can't solve this problem by rights talk. You can only resolve it through conflict, through struggle. 
And I think today we also have to recognize the importance of this argument, because there is a lot of rights talk around. And I think it's extremely interesting that Amnesty International, which deals mainly with civil and political rights, every now and again says, we would like to extend this into the world of economic rights, but it can't get very far without taking sides in class struggle. It either sides with capital or it sides with labor. Faced with that, Amnesty International withdraws from the discussion, because they don't want to be caught up in that particular politics. But you can see Marx's point, that actually here we have a situation in which there is no way in which you can solve the problem of who is right or who is wrong. You can't do it that way through a discussion of rights. And the chapter ends up with a very skeptical kind of statement about vague Magna Carta's about the universal rights of man, as opposed to what will be achieved through class struggle. The second point about this is that Marx talks about this and says, between equal rights, force decides. Now force here can, on occasion, mean simply physical force. But actually, the main thrust of the chapter is not about that, it's about political force. It's about political achievement. It's about the capacity to mobilize political power. So we're talking about force, which is, yes, an extremist, is going to be about violence and all the rest of it, but we're really talking here about political organization, political battle, class struggle, and all the institutions of class struggle. He doesn't talk much about that in this chapter, but nevertheless I think it's implied that when we're talking in this, in this way, we're going to say this issue is going to be resolved in this particular way. Now at this point, I think, we find something that is interesting and deserves some sort of immediate comment. By setting things up this way, Marx is moving away from the normal processes by which economists and political economists talk about the world. And I think it's fascinating to ask yourself the question, those of you who have taken an economics class. Did you talk about the length of the working day as a big issue? It's ignored, except maybe in some labor economics class somewhere separate. The general theory of economics does not deal with this issue. You can read your way through all of classical political economy and you won't find any kind of discussion over class struggle over the length of the working day. You can read John Locke and you won't find anything about struggle over the length of the working day. But when you ask yourself the question, historically, has that been an important aspect of capitalist history? Is that still today a very significant fact of what is going on around us all of the time? Struggles over the length of the working day, the working week, the working year, the working life, ages of retirement, how many vacation days you have, all of those kinds of things. These things are going on around us all the time. And from the 19th century onwards, this has been a very, very, very significant aspect of how capitalist societies have worked. And here you have Marx moving straight in to say, what my theory does is immediately tell you why that's the case and how it is the case. And in that sense, you would say, well, I mean, next time one of you takes, if you ever get to take an elementary economics class, why don't you ask questions about the length of the working day, <laughs> and how that is determined? And people look at you and say, I know what you've been reading. <laughs> and indeed, you'll say, well, you know, if you can't talk about that in your theory, then you're missing out on something that's incredibly important in terms of the political economy of the world. And we should be able to talk about it. And Marx is, of course, saying, this is one of the first issues that comes to my attention, which is, there is going to be a fight 
over the length of the working day. And that this fight is vital for understanding how capitalist society evolves and how it develops and who wins and who loses and who wins for a time and then loses out later and what happens when capital moves somewhere else where they can institute a working day of you know, twelve hours instead of uh, eight hours instead of six hours, those kinds of things start to become absolutely important. So this is one of the first points, I think, where if you interrogate immediately the utility, the use value, if you want to call it that, of the concept of value, you would say one of the useful things about it is that it immediately focuses our attention on this issue. And it does it in a certain way that reveals something, which is that this is not a market exchange process. This is a class struggle process. Now there are some dissident economic texts by people like Joan Robinson and so on who actually introduce some aspects of this into their economic argument, but of course they're dissident texts and I'm sure you won't find any of them taught in any of the major schools uh, in the United States when you're reading introductory economics. But he then points something else out, which is in the second section he says, well, right, the extraction of surplus labour from one group in society to the benefit of another group in society is not something unique to capitalism. Etruscan theocrats did it, Athenians did it, um, Egyptians did it, Aztec emperors did it. So the idea of surplus labour, which is taken away from one group and becomes the property or the, under the control of another group, is not unusual at all. But there's a big difference between surplus labour and surplus value. And the unique form of capitalism is that it's concerned with surplus value. And it is surplus value extracted from wage labour. And as we've seen in previous discussions about the theory of surplus value, the thing about it is the wage labourer can't identify it, can't see it clearly. It is mystified, it is hidden behind the fetish of the market exchange. So, as we kind of mentioned last time, it's not as if a bell goes off after you've reproduced the value of your labour power and then you say, OK, I'm working free for the capitalist. In fact, Marx introduces here the idea that actually it's not as if it really is just that part of the day is the reproduction of labour power and that part is the surplus. In fact, every 30 seconds you're sort of going through that surplus production plus reproduction process. So you can't see it. Now, in other societies, of course, you can see it. Under a serf society, and he's particularly interested in the corvée system and what the corvée system does. And the corvée system uh, is introduced in such a way that, yes, there's a certain amount of labour which you give to those who are going to control the surplus, and you know how many days it is. And he makes the point that the evolution of that was not out of serfdom, that actually serfdom was produced through the corvée system rather than serfdom generated the corvée system. The corvée system came in and then serfdom kind of attached itself, uh, arose, arose out of it. So again, we're not dealing with a serf society which then sort of introduces this system, we're, it, we're looking at this system which then produces states of, states of serfdom. But then he raises, I think, what is a very interesting kind of question. What happens when a system of that kind gets integrated with a capitalist system which is about the production of surplus value? What's the big difference? The big difference is this. Again, this argument has been made before. There's a limit to which you can accumulate use values. So if you're just creating use values for the Lord, there's a limit to the amount the Lord can absorb, or is even interested in having. But as soon as you monetize it, 
and you recognize money as a form of social power, there's no limit. So the result, he says, is that any system of this kind which then gets in contact with the monetized accumulation process of capital, which is limitless in principle, you put immense pressure on that corvée system and you become extremely exploitative. And this is part of his argument about what happened to slavery in the American South, it's also the argument he makes in relationship to the corvée system. But then there's something interesting he, he points to here. On 3.47, he starts to talk about the règlement organique. And he starts to talk about that this requires twel twelve working days. But here we start to see something else going on, which is going to be critically important for how we understand the dynamics of capitalism. Those twelve days of labor are not necessarily measured in days. They're measured in how much you can theoretically do in a day. So you put that amount and it turns out that it takes thirty-six days to do twelve days labor. And this goes on and he goes through how the calculations were made and then he ends up by kind of saying on 348, the twelve corvée days of the règlement organique, cried a boyard drunk with victory, amount to 365 days in the year. Now, I want to draw your attention to something here which is I think very important, which is the temporality. What is time? Because in effect, what the Boyar is doing is redefining temporality, and redefining what makes time. And the whole kind of definition of temporality really starts to enter into the discussion. And the capitalist definition of, of temporality is special to capitalism. Indeed, it expects the laborer to work 365 days a year. You know, forget that it's twelve days labor, just okay, 365 days a year. That's what you expect. From the capitalist standpoint, the worker will say, no, I want time off, I want, you know, all kinds of things of that sort. But so, what this chapter does <coughs> is begin to talk a little bit more specifically about how time is constructed and how it gets normalized in a certain kind of way, and we'll come back to that. But we see here the idea that time can be redefined social by a social process in a certain kind of way. And the redefinition is itself a part of a class project. That is, this redefinition wasn't just made by some imperial rule or something like that, it's, it's an outcome of a class project. So that the redefinition of temporality is done in such a way as to advantage that class which is going to extract the surplus labor, and later on, of course, the surplus value. What Marx then does is to switch perspectives. In the next passage he talks about the opposite tendency, which is not to stretch time in that kind of way, but to restrict it in another. And he talks he introduces the idea of the English Factory Acts, which he says are the negative expression of the same appetite. These laws curb capital's drive towards a limitless draining of labour power. Again, that limitless draining of labour power is significant against the limitless capacity to accumulate money capital. A limitless draining away of labour power by forcibly limiting the working day on the authority of the state but a state ruled by a capitalist and landlord. Then he says, apart from the daily more threatening advance of the working class movement, the limiting of factory labour was dictated by the same necessity as forced the manuring of English fields with guano. The same blind desire for profit that in the one case exhausted the soil, had in the other case seized hold of the vital force of the nation at its roots. <coughs> 
Now, this is interesting. A few interesting points here. First, why would a state ruled by capitalist and landlord agree to limit the length of the working day? And to do so apart from the fact there was a working class movement that became more threatening. And in effect what Marx is going to do is to talk about class relations between these various groups in society, and how those class relations intersected in this struggle around the question of the regulation of the working day. He also introduces here, of course, <coughs> immediately, the idea of capitalists left to themselves are likely to go too far. And if you remember his arguments about wealth, not value, the sources of wealth are the earth, he engendered it by saying the earth is the mother and labour is the father of wealth. These are the two basic sources of wealth. And capitalists left to their own devices without any regulatory regime are likely to destroy both. They'll destroy the environment, resource base, as well as they will destroy the labour force and the labour power by super-exploitation, unless they are checked. So there is an element here of class interest in even checking themselves, and we'll come back to that later on. And a recognition that you can push things a bit too far, even on the part of the capitalist class, although we see in this chapter that was very little developed until the final, towards the final end of the period that Marx is talking about. But then there's another element which enters into here, which is the state. Again, we haven't got a theory of the state here yet. We've got an element of it in the chapter on money, because the state is absolutely essential for the regulation of money. But here we see the state entering in, in another dimension. And the dimension, I think, is most clearly spelled out in footnote 13, which is the, the state has an interest in having a working class which is well fed enough and healthy enough to go to war. And if they're so sick and they're so decimated and they're so ill and they're consumptive and all the rest of it, and you put them into battle, they're not going to be able to do much good. So the state has an interest in maintaining the basis for at least a healthy kind of army. And this became a singular preoccupation throughout much of the 19th century. There was a general explanation given of how it was that the German army rolled so easily over the French army in 1870. And that general explanation was that those Prussian peasants were far better fed than the French were. They were much healthier, and the French working class were absolutely incapable of carrying a rifle. So there was this kind of concern, and, it, and actually, but this concern, you'll find it in World War II, by the way, when people started to try to recruit people into the armed services, they found that many people were not healthy enough to go to the armed services. And this was true in Britain, that a lot of the people coming out of the East End, impoverished areas, were, not, were simply not fit enough to, to go to war. And to some degree that led into the construction of a socialist, uh, a, a, a consensus around more socialist politics after World War II. Uh, again, partly for these militaristic reasons, but then also for other reasons. So, these issues then about the super-exploitation of the labour force uh, have some resonance. And it is at this point also that Marx introduces into his story 
the figure of the factory inspectors. Now, Marx could not have written this chapter without the testimony of the factory inspectors. He relies very heavily on the factory inspectors. And while the, uh, the capitalist class, as he mentions towards the end, when they got so angry about all the stuff the, uh, the factory inspectors were producing, kind of basically described them as, you know, commies and reds and like the con you know, convention of the French Revolutionary period, uh, you have to ask yourself again the question, why in the absence of political power on the part of the working class did Parliament actually set up a factory inspectorate, and why did the factory inspectorate actually push things pretty hard? I mean, when you look at their testimony, you've got to say, they're not, they're not just standing there, kind of saying, uh, oh well, I'm not really going to be bothered. I mean, it's not as if they they become uh, patsies like uh, OSHA has now become under, you know, from Reagan to Bush and to Bush and all the rest of it, that they're not prepared to challenge anything. They're challenging a tremendous amount in this literature. And what Marx is tapping into here is, is something which, again, is important politically, and he mentions it just by passing, which is a sense of bourgeois reformism, which was quite strong in 19th century Britain. And it goes back to that idea of what is civilized. What is civilized? And the bourgeoisie segments of it being truly shocked at the kind of uncivilized situations they saw in the factories. And they were shocked at the, what they saw as the immorality, they were shocked at the conditions of labor, they were shocked at all these kinds of things. And so there was, if you like, a bourgeois reformist tendency. And it was there, it's pretty strong. You see it today, as people go protesting about sweatshop labor. Many of the people protesting against, against that are not workers themselves, they're, if you like, middle class, bourgeois elements who are kind of saying that should not be the case. We should not be wearing clothes which are made by, you know, unpaid Guatemalan children of, four, of 14 years old. That, that's wrong. So you will find a, a persistent history of that kind of sense of civilized morality, and Marx is actually benefiting from that, because in part that was where the factory inspectors were coming from. But they were also coming from out of a concrete history of struggle, which we will get into shortly. Now what this then leads Marx into, is to look more closely at actually how working day is determined. And he gets out of this one crucial singular principle, which is, again, going to connect us back to the theory of value. And this is laid out best on page 352, where he talks about the way in which, and again this is the testimony of the factory in inspectors, about how capital engaged, engaged, engages, he says, these small thefts of capital from the workers' meal times and recreation times are also described by the factory inspectors as, uh, factory inspectors as petty pilferings of minutes, snatching a few minutes or in the technical language of the workers, nibbling and cribbling at mealtimes. It is evident that in this atmosphere the formation of surplus value by surplus labor is no secret. And then he quotes somebody saying, moments are the elements of profit. Now that idea that moments are the elements of profit is important because what it does is it suggests that capitalists are interested, vitally interested, in every moment that the worker is in the factory. And they want to survey every moment, control every moment. And again this comes back to the fact that value is socially necessary labor time. Therefore, if the worker goes to the bathroom too much, the capitalist is losing value and surplus value. If the worker spends too much time 
over lunch, tea breaks, whatever. It's a loss of value to the, to the capitalist, a, lo a loss of surplus value. So therefore, the capitalist becomes absolutely concerned with time management, the management of the worker's time. And this, of course, becomes a general capitalist principle, which carries over into all aspects of society. I once remember being instructed uh, by a group of uh, very supposedly wise Harvard professors on how to teach an incoming class of undergraduates how to survive in the university. And the first principle they, outlay, they laid out, and they spent most of their time talking about, it, was time management. You kind of go, and I said something, you mean this is a factory or, 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 or what? No, no, they can't manage their time, and as, as a, an instructor you have to instruct them on time management, and you have to watch their time management. And if they're failing on their time management, you have to tell them immediately they've got a problem with their time management. So this is a general, this has now become a general principle of capitalist society, but Marx is talking about it inside the factory, this is crucial. Moments are the elements of profit. And what this means, of course, is that there's continual pressure within the capitalist system to try to capture more and more of those moments, and to make sure how those moments are utilized. I mean, I love those old 1940s films where people call up the operator and have a chat with the operator and then sort of get on somewhere, you know. You try having a chat with an operator on AT&T these days. I mean, they have, a, they, 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 they have to handle a certain number of calls per hour, and if they don't meet, meet that schedule, they're fired. And each time the number of calls they have to, per hour. So if you have a, problem, a real problem and you want to talk to them about something, they hang up on you because they can't afford I mean, this happens. It happened to me last week, you know, I had a problem with my phone, I was trying to get it fixed and nobody would, you know. They, after, after the thing became a bit more complicated, they, 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 they hung up and then you had to go through all of the you know, phone messages again in order to get back in and say, look, I've been hung up on twice now. These are the kinds of, these, this is the kind of world in which we, which, which, which we live, where moments are the elements of profit and that's, that's all, that, all that matters. So Marx is, I think, connecting that to this idea, moments are the elements of profit, that's what the labor theory of value tells you, and that's what the theory of surplus value tells you is going to be mobilized in the production process. So this then leads him to look at how this works in many, many different areas, and I'm not going to really talk about them, you know, we talk about uh, the pottery industry, we talk about match, match uh, uh, manufacture, baking, bread industry, all those kinds of things, so there's a whole kind of stuff. He then talks about railway accidents and the way in which when many people have to work 30 hours c continuously, they make mistakes, and so there was this uh, uh, example of the railway accident where people have been working for that length of time, and even, even the coroner kind of said, well, maybe you shouldn't have done it, you know. But it, and then there's a famous case of Mary Ann Walkley, 20 years old, employed in a highly respectable dressmaking establishment, exploited by a lady with the pleasant name of Elise. The old often told story was now re revealed once again. These girls work on an average 16 and a half hours without a break during the season, often 30 hours, and the flow of their failing labor power is maintained by occasional supplies of sherry port or coffee. And Marianne Walkley had worked inter uninterruptedly for 26 and a half hours with 60 other girls, 30 in each room, and at night the girls slept in pairs. And Marianne Walkley died from long hours of work in an overcrowded workroom and a too small and badly ventilated bedroom. Now, dying from overwork is uh, not an uncommon uh, phenomenon. But as in this case, uh, I guess the coroner said it was apoplexy, which it, it maybe had been exacerbated by uh, the work conditions. The Japanese actually, I can't, I, I can't remember the actual term for it, but the Japanese actually have a word of dying from too, hard, too much hard work and it's a category in Japan which they're willing to utilize. We don't use that category uh, in this country, so you would not be able to go to the statistical data and find out how many people died from hard work, uh, 
But if you care to, you know, uh, inquire very much, I think you would find that would be uh, a, 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 a significant category uh, in our society. In any case, as he ends up the chapter, he really talks about uh, the diminished life expectancy that somebody who instead of living a, until 50 dies at 37. Now, life expectancy tables are extremely interesting. Um, for instance, in the steel industry in Baltimore in 1970 or so, the life expectancy of the steel workers was 64 years as opposed to 72 or whatever it was on average. And even if you compared it with the African American community, which was a lower life expectancy because many of the steel workers were African American, you would still find a diminished life expectancy in that industry. And we will find the same thing in many areas of work, like coal mining and, and all the rest of it. So the whole kind of question of life expectancy and dying from overwork is a, a very significant uh, element within the system. So this then takes us into section four, where Mark talks about day work and night work. And the point here is again something which we've hit before, which is the idea that once capitalists have money wrapped up in machines and capital, they want to get it back as soon as possible. That is, they want that capital to be fully employed 24 hours a day, which leads immediately into the need to have labor available 24 hours a day. How is that going to be done? It's going to be done through the relay system. And this relay system becomes uh, a significant aspect of the mobilization of labor, and again, it can dis disguise in some ways the stresses that attach to certain kinds of notions of length of the working day. I mean, you can start to split the relay system up into pieces. People do different pieces at different times, and this too becomes a, a, a very strong pressure which has to be resisted, if you like, on part of, part of workers. But then we come in section five, which starts 375, into the struggle for a normal working day. And this struggle for a normal working day entails us in the, as he says, in trying to understand the dynamics of how the capitalist approaches, approaches the question, the labor question. So he starts off by saying, all right, as far as the capitalist is concerned, it is self-evident that the worker is nothing other than labor power for the duration of his whole life, and that therefore all his disposable time is by nature and by right, notice by right, labor time to be devoted to the self-valorization of capital. Time for education, for intellectual development, for fulfillment of social functions, for social intercourse, for the free play of the vital forces of his body and his mind, even the rest time, time of Sunday. What foolishness! But in its blind and measureless drive, its insatiable appetite for surplus labor, capital oversteps not only the moral but even the merely physical limits of the working day it usurps the time for growth, development, and healthy maintenance of the body. It steals the time required for the consumption of fresh air and sunlight. It haggles over the meal times, where possible incorporating them into the production process itself. For those of you who've seen Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, you'll remember his great spoof of trying to eat while he's in the machine, more or less. So that food is added to the worker as a mere means of production, as coal is supplied to the boiler and grease and oil to the machinery. It reduces the sound sleep needed for the restoration, renewal, and refreshment of the vital forces to the exact amount of torpor essential for the revival of an absolutely exhausted organism. He says, It is not the normal maintenance of labor power which determines the limits of the working day here, but rather the greatest possible daily expenditure of labor power, no matter how diseased, compulsory, and painful it may be which determines the limits of the worker's period of rest. Capital asks no questions, and after all, why should it, about the length of life of labor power. What interests it is purely and simply the maximum of labor power that begins set in motion in a working day. It attains this objective by shortening the life of labor power in the same way as the greedy farmer snatches more produce from the soil by robbing 
of it, it of its fertility. But he then says in the next two paragraphs, now at some point even capitalists may recognize that this is a stupid thing to do. Uh, that you're destroying the source of value and of wealth. So, he suggests on 377 that you would think a rational capitalist would seem therefore to have, uh, he says, it would seem therefore that the interest of capital itself points in the direction of a normal working day. <coughs> he then switches to talk about the slave owner and says, well, slave owners guard their slaves, but do so only when it is hard for them to procure replacements. If it's easy for them to get replacements, then they just kill them off and then they just buy some more. Why should they care? And then he says on 378, for slave trade, read Labour Market. For Kentucky and Virginia, Ireland and the agricultural districts of Scotland, of England, Scotland and Wales, for Africa, Germany. What he's beginning to introduce here is the idea that a labour surplus has a crucial role to play in how this dynamic works. And he first talks about the way in which a labour surplus, or a surplus population in the South, was sent to the North under the aegis of the Poor Law Commissioners. In other words, you needed labour up North, people were in the agricultural districts of the South, maintained in the Poor Law, so as soon as they went on the Poor Law, the Commissioners rounded them up and shipped them North and put them in the factories. But this then leads, on 380, to a very important argument. What experience generally shows to the capitalist is a constant excess of population, i.e. an excess in relation to capital's need for valorization at a given moment. Although this throng of people is made up of generations of stunted, short-lived and rapidly replaced human beings plucked, so to speak, before they were ripe. Experience shows to the intelligent observer how rapidly and firmly capitalist production has seized the vital forces of the people at their very roots. It then talks about the degeneration of the industrial population, which is retarded only by the constant absorption of primitive and natural elements from the countryside. Now, this theme of the labour surplus is critical. And it's something that's going to come back again and again throughout capital. That it's only when you have a large labour surplus that you're in a position to discipline the existing labourers and also replace them as you need to at relatively low wages. And this leads Marx to say, so what this does, in a situation where the population of this sort exists, the capitalists have a think, simple, simple way of thinking, which he suggests on 381. Après moi le déluge is the watchword of every capitalist and of every capitalist nation. Capital therefore takes no account of the health and length of life of the worker unless society for forces, forces it to do so. Its answer to the outcry about the physical and mental degradation, the premature death, the torture of overwork is this. Should that pain trouble us, since it increases our pleasure, profit? But looking at these things as a whole, it is evident that this does not depend on the will, either good or bad, of the individual capitalist. Under free competition, the imminent laws of capitalist production confront the individual capitalist as, coercive, as a coercive force external to him. Here also, there is a very important theme. What Marx calls the coercive laws of competition. Individual capitalists don't have a choice. If I'm an individual capitalist and I want to be nice to my workers, pay them a lot, and only employ them sort of six hours a day, and I'm competing with somebody who's paying them very little and working them twelve hours a day, how can I possibly stay in business? So Marx is kind of saying here, look, 
doesn't matter if you're a nice capitalist or a greedy, horrible, disgusting, sadistic capitalist. You're all going to have to come down to the same level, because that's where the coercive laws of competition push you. And this theme of the coercive laws of competition as a mechanism that disciplines individual capitalists is going to be also important in the rest of this book. This then takes him into the next section on the establishment of a normal working day, which he's going to talk about as a result of centuries of struggle between the capitalist and the worker. <coughs> but he then starts off with what I think is an extremely interesting point, that the initial legislation about the length of the working day was about trying to socialize and discipline the worker into the idea of a normalized working day. And he goes back to Statute of Laborers from 1349, and then he tracks through all of that legislation. Now, what he's talking about here is the socialization of wage labor to a disciplinary regime around a certain notion of temporality. And the history he tells here is interesting because it suggests it wasn't easily done. It actually took a lot of state action. Most people faced with the pr prospect of wage labor said it's better to be a beggar or a vagabond or, a, you know, uh, engage in uh, you know, crime and all the rest of it. So what that took was the state to come in and actually round people up who were not good wage labourers and you know, whip them publicly or put them in the stocks or do horrible things to them, in order to absolutely indicate to them that the only way they could really survive, if they had been forced off the land, was to become wage labourers and that to become wage labourer meant to accept a certain kind of time discipline. Now one of the most interesting places where you'll find this sort of thing fought out is amongst uh, colonial administrators. Again and again, you know, you're reading colo what colonial administrators say, they say, the trouble with these, popula these people is they don't have a time discipline. You know, they work for a few hours and then they disappear. Or they work for a week and we think that's fine, and then they disappear. We can't keep them here. And so there was a tremendous kind of literature in the colonial office about what kinds of tribal groups were susceptible to time discipline and wh what weren't, and who you could discipline easily, and who you had to actually whip into order. And actually one of the big issues for, for colonial administrations was precisely time discipline. And what was so interesting about this is the way in which the notion of temporality had to be normalized and workers had to be normalized, and had to accept normality. And again, this has become a social, a generalized social aspect of society. We all accept a certain kind of time discipline. We kind of figure, well, you know, okay, there's a nine to five work, or okay, I've got to be in college at this time and out by that time. You know, uh, you wouldn't tolerate it if your teachers gave speeches like Fidel Castro does, which go on for twelve hours, you're going to start looking at the clock. 8.30, you look at the clock, the time discipline steps in. You know, we've normalized it, we've all normalized it, so in fact it constructs our lives, and we've accepted that normalization. But what Marx is talking about is a world in which that was not the case. That this time discipline had not been accepted, and it took a lot of violence, a lot of social pressure, and that social pressure was organized through the state, but it was also organized through all manner of institutions. And it was partly, of course, also normalized through recognizing, as he does towards the end of this chapter, that actually what capitalists insist upon is you shouldn't pay, too, pay people too much, because if you paid them too much they wouldn't work for six days or, or whatever it was, they'd only work for five. 
So if you paid them less, then they'd work because Laborers are inherently lazy. They don't want to go to work. They don't want to spend you know, the whole week down the coal mines. They want to do something else. There was a terrible problem of labor discipline in France because there was something called Blue Monday, in which the, the, the artisan class in particular would get so roaring drunk on Sunday they couldn't possibly go to work on Monday. So there was nothing that could be done on Monday, and so the, the attempt to sort of wean them away from those habits, you know, and, and you know, disciplinarians would get in there and start talking about you know, the iniquities of getting drunk on Sundays, and they would try to mobilize family ideals and so on against you know, the guys going out and getting totally smashed on Sundays. It turned out it wasn't only the guys who were doing it, the women were doing it too, which was considered even worse by the bourgeois. So there's tremendous kind of questions about, about labor discipline in, in the 19th century, and Marx is, I think, pointing uh, out uh, those, 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 those problems. But then the institutional arrangements at the end, he talks about, are very interesting. He says, you know, it's not only this general kind of assault, but also there are specific kinds of institutions. And in particular, there is what he calls on 388 an ideal workhouse. An ideal workhouse must be made a house of terror and not an asylum for the poor, where they are to be plentifully fed, warmly and decently closed, clothed, and where they do but little work. In this house of terror, this ideal workhouse, the poor shall work fourteen hours in a day, allowing proper time for meals in such a manner that there shall remain twelve hours of neat labor. And right at the end, the house of terror for paupers, only dreamed of by the capitalist mind in 1770, was brought into being a few years later in the shape of a gigantic workhouse for the industrial worker himself. It was called the factory, and this time the ideal was a pale shadow compared with the reality. Now, what is interesting here is to reflect on the way that somebody like Foucault, for example, talks about the disciplinary apparatuses that came into being in the 17th, 18th centuries in particular as part and parcel of creating a self-discipline in ourselves which made governmentality so much easier for the bourgeois state. And what Foucault does in many ways is, it seems to me, extend this whole idea here through books like Madness and Civilization, through The Birth of the Clinic, and particularly through Discipline and Punish. Now, there's a very interesting kind of way in which Foucault is often viewed as somehow or other being anti-Marxist. Well, he was anti the Maoists, and he was anti the Trotskyists, and he was anti the Communist Party, but it's very clear when you read this and you read the, that literature, that this is his starting point. And all of those, 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 those French intellectuals really started uh, from a very good understanding of this. And this is, if you like, the kind of passage that it seems to me that Foucault takes and says, OK, I can extend that. And I had to say, when I first read all that literature by Foucault, I didn't see it as any way antagonistic to Marx at all. I thought it was an extension. Uh, it was an elaboration, and with a, some transformation involved too, but that this was a, a wonderful way in which to start to think about the sorts of issues that Marx is talking about here. The, 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 the creation of a disciplinary apparatus, of socialization pressures, institutional arrangements, in Foucault's case, you know, panopticons, uh, asylums, uh, and, and workhouses as well, all of those become part of this disciplinary apparatus which is trying to normalize us into accepting a certain temporality and a certain disciplinary apparatus as being part and parcel of our daily lives. So this is, I think, a very important element to do, and I, you know, I think it's very important to sort of read Foucault alongside of this and realize exactly how Foucault is elaborating on this and to what extent he later on became, as it were, uh, somewhat more uh, separated from what Marx was talking about, but in his early stuff certainly it was an elaboration of many of these ideas uh, rather than a, a disputation against them. We should stop here and take uh, a little break, then we'll finish off the chapter and next. We, uh, he gives an account of the struggle over the length of the working day in uh, Britain from uh, the 1820s up to 1850s, 1860s. And uh, I don't propose to 
go over this dynamic in too much uh, detail or, uh, from the text, but I, I want to, in a way, try to clarify uh, the background uh, to the story. What you had in uh, Britain in the 1820s in particular was a political power structure that was dominated by an agricultural aristocracy by landed interest. And at the same time you had a rising bourgeoisie, partly merchant, but increasingly industrial in the industrial districts. And we, what we see coming out here is the importance of what you might call the, the Manchester school of economic thinking, which is very much, of course, associated with the rise of the cotton industry as a major force in industrial production, but also in British uh, political and economic uh, life. So the industrial interest and the industrial bourgeoisie is relatively disempowered, however, in relationship to this uh, landed aristocracy. And they started to try to push pretty hard towards gaining some kind of more democratic power. Uh, the way, for example, the landed aristocracy was dominating was by a system of what was called rotten boroughs. For those of you who know what that is, uh, there would be um, a place where there was almost no population, uh, which would return one or some some cases three members of parliament. And that place happened to be on the landed estate or in the pocket of, it's called a pocket borough, in the pocket of one or other of the landed aristocrats who on election day would take five or seven or twenty of the retainers and they would go there and they would vote this person into parliament. So this is how the majority was maintained in parliament. So there was a movement towards parliamentary reform to get rid of the rotten boroughs and all those kinds of things, which was attaching, uh, uh, attracting a certain amount of bourgeois support, but was also <coughs> attracting a certain amount of working class support. And the industrial bourgeoisie was actually very interested in trying to attract popular support from the working class. And so politically, the working class was divided into an artisan group that was highly literate, uh, self-educated, and then a mass of the population, agrarian base, and who were not literate and therefore uh, not. But so the, the industrial bourgeoisie was particularly interested in, in sort of trying to <coughs> attach to it uh, the support of the artisan class in a program towards parliamentary reform, in which it was envisaged that you'd have a very much more democratic form of government, in which it was envisaged that the certain reforms would be instituted, uh, among which would be some kind of legislation to curb the worst aspects of uh, industrial, industrial labor. So there was a proposal for factory acts and so on. Well, the great reform thing finally passed, and there was a great kind of reform of 1832, which from the working class standpoint was quickly dubbed the Great Betrayal. And the Great Betrayal was, first of all, the reform of the voting structure didn't empower anybody significantly within the working class. It only, in effect, uh, empowered, it got rid of the, the, the artificial power of the landed aristocracy and, and empowered uh, more and more of the industrial bourgeoisie and those, those members of the, the middle classes that had significant, significant assets and significant property. So in effect, it was uh, a reform that favoured the property-owning classes. And immediately, of course, the property-owning property classes passed a very weak factory act, one which is not significant at all. And that indeed was uh, part of the uh, reason why the workers themselves started to get extremely disillusioned uh, with the alliance they might have had with the industrial bourgeoisie and increasingly start to go against the industrial bourgeoisie. But the industrial bourgeoisie had something else on its agenda, which was the reform of something called the Corn Laws. Now, corn in English is wheat. Uh, and what that meant was that the, the, the tariffs on imported grains were going to be re reduced very significantly. 
uh, because this was on, in, again in the industrialist's interest, uh, because cheap grain meant cheap bread, which meant lower wages. Uh, they went to the working class and said, wouldn't you be interested in cheap bread? But by then the working class recognized that maybe, you know, cheap bread also meant lower wages, by then they sort of figured out the little suspicion, but they actually tried to, did again try to mobilize the working class around uh, kind of the abolition of the, uh, of the tariffs on imported, on imported grains. Uh, but the trouble with that, it, when, when you ab abolish that, you abolish a lot of the power of the landed aristocracy in Britain. In other words, uh, their agrarian interest was very severely threatened, and they were thoroughly, thoroughly uh, pissed off, to put it mildly, with the, uh, you know, with the industrial bourgeoisie and what it was doing. So one of the ways in which it figured it could get back against the industrial bourgeoisie was to start to actually act like they were kind of noblesse oblige with respect to the working class and say, well, you know, we are not those people who are doing these awful things to you down the mines and in the factories and so on, so we're going to try and help you uh, over these factory acts things. So they started to go into an alliance with kind of the working class to put pressure on the factory acts, and out of that there came some of this progressive movement in the 1840s uh, towards uh, instituting uh, the, uh, some, factor, some regulation on the Factory Acts. And the f initially, of course, a lot of this was taken up on a kind of a moral basis which was primarily concerned with the employment of women and children. And that is what the, 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 the first part of, uh, of the agitation was really, was really dedicated to. And so what Marx points out is that this, this, if you like, this complicated sort of jousting of class alliances and the shift of class alliances from a class alliance between workers and an industrialist to get the Reform Act through and then after that an alliance which emerged between the agrarian landed aristocracy and, and, and working class pressures and as working class independent organization through something called the Chartist movement started to become much stronger so what you would then see towards the end of, sort of, end of the 1940s was a considerable alliance which was really beginning to push uh, the, uh, the capitalist bourgeoisie to concede something on, 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 working class, on, on the length of the working day. And eventually they conceded things and then they tried to subvert it by you know, all of these games of, of again, uh, there's a wonderful phrase Marx uses, you know, well, if you eradicate child labor there's a big question of when, when, is, when do you stop being a child? And uh, capitalist anthropology said nine years old, <laughs> and and of course other people say no, it's later. You know, I mean, so the whole again the whole kind of question of the temporality uh, get, gets get, gets in here, and then also the way in which the capitalists started to use all sorts of things. For instance, if you limit it to, to ten hours, does, what does that ten hours include? Does that does that start outside the factory gate or inside the factory? Uh, and, and by the way, if workers don't have timepieces, you set the factory clock at, uh, and they're supposed to be there at six o'clock, but actually you put it, you know, so it's, it, 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 it says, you know, six o'clock when it's actually quarter to six. And then when the workers want to leave, they look at the clock and it says six o'clock when actually it's quarter past six. So that way, I mean, all kinds of things like that were going on, and, and, and it became clear, and this is where the factory inspectors, who had largely come out of this kind of noblesse oblige kind of support from the landed aristocracy, the factory inspectors then started to kind of say, well, this is not operative, it's not working, uh, and we've got to do something about it. So they tried to take it to the courts, and then, as always happens when you take it to the Supreme Court, you lose. Uh, oh, that's wrong, sorry. When you take it to the English courts, not the Supreme Court. Of course you win in this Supreme Court, right? <laughs> uh, okay. You lose, so, so there's no point taking, going to the courts, and, and even the factory inspectors who are taking things to the courts said, there's no point. I've taken, you know, Horner, Leonard Horner kind of says, I've, I've taken eight courses, and eight cases, and I've only won one, and this is just, just a waste of time, it's not, nothing's going to happen out of this. But then there happens a significant event of, of 1848, and in 1848 there is a massive crisis of overaccumulation of capital, and, 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 and there's massive unemployment that results, and you get revolutions breaking out all over Europe. And uh, as Marx kind of says, uh, 
the capitalists waged a camp, the, 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 the bourgeois capitalists waged a campaign against the Factory Act, but they couldn't, they couldn't make it work. Uh, but then they, they had this fortuitous event of 1848, and I'll have to read this bit to you, it always a somewhat um, is a sort of interesting way of putting it. He says, the preliminary cam campaign of capital, this is on 397, the preliminary campaign of capital thus came to grief, and the Ten Hours Act came into force on 1st May 1848. Meanwhile, however, the fiasco of the Chartist Party, whose leaders had been imprisoned and whose organisation dismembered, had shattered the self-confidence of the English working class. Soon after this, the June insurrection in Paris and its bloody suppression united, in England as on the continent, all fractions of the ruling classes. Landowners and capitalists, stock exchange sharks and small-time shopkeepers, protectionists and free traders, government and opposition, priests and free thinkers, and I have no idea why they're in here, young whores and old nuns, <laughs> under, the common, on, under the common slogan of the salvation of property, religion, the family and society. Now, have you heard that recently? <laughs> property, religion, the family and society? Whenever the bourgeoisie gets threatened, what does it do? It always appeals to these categories of property, religion, the family and society. And the result of this, Marx goes on to say, is everywhere the working class was outlawed, anathematized, placed under the loi de suspect. The manufacturers no longer needed to restrain themselves, they broke out in open revolt, uh, not only against the Ten Hours Act, but against all the legislation since 1833 that had aimed at restricted, to some extent, the free exploitation of labour power. It was a pro-slavery rebellion in miniature, carried on for over two years with a cynical recklessness and a terroristic energy which was so much the easier to achieve in that the rebel capitalist risked nothing but the skin of his workers. Now, this situation of these class, you know, if, if you want a really good piece by Marx, you go and read The Eighteenth Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, which is a fantastic story of shifting class alliances around the revolution of 1848 in Paris. But here we're getting a similar kind of bit of a story about the shifting nature of class alliances in and around factory acts and how uh, this, was, this was being worked out. And we see that events, at some point or other, when all property owners get threatened, when the bourgeoisie suddenly comes together and consolidates around a single program, which is to oppress uh, the workers, which was effectively what happened in June of 1848 in Paris, when the working class revolution in Paris was violently suppressed. And in effect, it wasn't, didn't have to be violently repressed in Britain, uh, it was peace of, peacefully repressed, if you like, and, but it gave the opportunity to the, the capitalists to reverse almost all of those progressive moves that had been made. Uh, again, there are certain parallels, uh, you've only got to look at how, for example, the decisions made by the National Labor Relations Board in this country up until the point where Reagan took power, and after Reagan took power, all of the OSHA legislation, all of the National Labor Relations Board legislation became totally pro-capitalistic. And I think in about three years, the National Labor Relations Board reversed about 70% of all the decisions that had been made earlier after Reagan uh, appointed uh, the commissioners in, in the early 1980s. So again, what we find here, again, when you look back at that, you would, you would do an analysis, I think, a bit like Marx is doing, of kind of saying, what were the class forces behind this, and what were the politi political conditions which allowed something like that to happen, and why did it happen in the particular way it did? And I think this framework of analysis Marx sets up for historical inquiry is one which is interesting to, to think about for those of you who are kind of interested in understanding contemporary events. You, you don't kind of think about individuals so much as you start to look at class forces, class interests, how they get mobilized behind this position, how they shift, how deals get cut, uh, and, and how, they, how, how things actually shift around. But then Marx goes on to tell the story after 1850, and what we find is that after 1850 there is a growing recognition that some sort of compromise about this working day is, is, is necessary, in part for the reasons we've discussed, that if you push things too far they just 
get out of hand, and even, even the industrialists start to think that actually things have gone a little bit too, too far. And the result of that is that by the time you get to 1853, and he takes this up on 408, by the time you get to 1853, the factory legislation which had been initially targeted just on a few select industries, there's a recognition that more and more industries are being organized along these intensely capitalistic lines, and these intensely capitalistic lines mean that the regulatory regime has to be extended across nearly all industries. And by 1853 you get to this point where Marx says, nevertheless the principle had triumphed with its victory in those great branches of industry which form the most characteristic cre creation of the modern mode of production. Their wonderful development from 1853 to 1860, the irony being that after this legislation is introduced, you get this boom, uh, went hand in hand, he says, with the physical and moral regeneration of the factory workers, and this was visible to the weakest eyes. And then, how many times has this happened historically? It's a wonderful kind of story. The very manufacturers from whom the legal limitation and regulation of the working day had been wrung step by step in the course of a civil war lasting half a century, now pointed boastfully to the contrast with the areas of exploitation which were still free. The Pharisees of political economy now proclaimed that their newly won insight into the necessity for a legally regulated working day was a characteristic achievement of their science. <laughs> it will easily be understood that after the factory magnates had resigned themselves and submitted to the inevitable, capital's power of resistance gradually weakened, while at the same time the working class's power of attack grew with a number of its allies, again allies, the allies of the working class become crucial here, in those social layers not directly interested in the question. Hence the comparatively rapid progress since 1860. Now Marx doesn't say what those social layers were, not directly interested in the question. And this was not so much the landed aristocracy as it was professional middle classes. Professional middle class interests, you know, seeing the situation, had decided that, well, they were going to not put up with living in a kind of country where these sorts of practices were allowed. So again, the Allies become significant. And the Allies were significant because, of course, working class did not have the vote until after 1867 in Britain. Male working class, that is, 1867. So, so it was not working class vote that did this, it was a parliament that then became attached to a regulatory regime. And this regulatory regime didn't only s apply to this area. This was an era when there was a lot of public health re legislation, uh, because of the, only that was the only way you could deal with the cholera epidemics, uh, you get stuff about water supply, you get even in Birmingham you get the uh, beginnings of a new regime of, uh, of governance, uh, which is structured by Joseph Chamberlain, an industrialist, uh, conservative industrialist, who however insisted on public education, housing for low-income populations, clean water, good sewage, all those sorts of things, so he was called Radical Joe, so, radi so you get a new kind of climate of, of, of activity in Britain in the 1860s that recognizes that the abuses uh, have, that have uh, occurred have to be eliminated. But at the same time, what we're also going to find is that this extension of the working day in this kind of way mattered less and less for the capitalists because they'd found another way to construct surplus value. And that other way is relative surplus value, which we're going to get into next week. And in, in, a, in effect, what we see is this struggle over the length of the working day forcing capitalists into a reform which is not necessarily against their interest. And Marx then talks about the way in which this reform not only affected England, but also spread around the world to some degree, and he particularly is interested 
in the cases of France in the next section and of the United States. And he sees clearly that in America, as he says on 414, labor in a white skin cannot emancipate itself where it is branded in a black skin. However, a new life immediately arose from the death of slavery. Unfortunately, it wasn't as dead as Marx was assuming. And then he talks about the General Congress of Labor held in Baltimore in August 1866. And the general pressure towards, again, regulation of the length of the working day in this country. This leads to the conclusion, and I think we should discuss this. It must be acknowledged, he says, that our worker emerges from the process of production looking different from when he entered it. In the market, as owner of the commodity labor power, he stood face to face with other owners of commodities, one owner against another owner. The contract by which he sold his labor power to the capitalist proved in black and white, so to speak, that he was free to dispose of himself. But when the transaction was concluded, it was discovered that he was no free agent, that the period of time for which he is free to sell his labor power is a period of time for which he is forced to sell it. That, in fact, the vampire will not let go, while there remains a single muscle, sinew, or drop of blood, blood to be exploited. For the protection against the serpent of their agonies, the workers have to put their heads together. And as a class, compel the passing of a law and all-powerful social barrier by which they can be prevented from selling themselves and their families into slavery and death by voluntary contract with capital. In place of the pompous catalogue of the inalienable rights of man, there steps the modest Magna Carta of the legally limited working day, which at last makes clear when the time which the worker sells is ended and when his own begins. Now, a couple of issues I want to raise about this conclusion and discuss with you. First, there's the, the issue of the inalienable rights of man, and we've talked a little bit about that, and how you cannot approach this through the, the discourse of rights. You can't expect the courts to decide. It's going to be an outcome of this struggle. And here again, for the first time, Marx is kind of saying that workers have to put their heads together. And how they put their heads together is going to have a huge impact upon this particular issue. But then when you look at it and you reflect upon it, what you see also is that the capitalists left to their own devices are going to undermine their own class interests. The coercive laws of competition are going to force individual capitalists to behave in such a way as to destroy the capacity of their own class reproduction at the end of the day. If it went on in unlimited ways and you killed all your laborers off, what's going to happen? Where are you going to get your surplus value from? So there's a sense in which Workers, by putting their heads together and forcing this law, actually save capital from their own stupidity. In other words, workers putting their heads together in this chapter seems to have the effect of stabilizing the capitalist system, not overthrowing it. Now this is a difficult conclusion to reach, right? Because Marx is a revolutionary thinker who presumably wants to overthrow it. But he's not talking about overthrowing it here, he's talking about accommodating to it in such a way that you get a fair wage for a fair day's work, a modest Magna Carta, you get that, and the capitalist survives, but the capitalist survives actually in better condition than they would have survived if they'd been allowed to let the coercive laws of competition to force them to engage in this après moi le deluge behavior. We can make the same argument, by the way, about environmental regulation. The environmental movement, there's a certain aspect of it which forces capital to accommodate in such a way as to avoid its own stupidities. And the, what happens under the coercive laws of competition. 
So there's an interesting issue here. In part, of course, Marx gets that to that point for the very simple reason that at the very, very beginning of the chapter he's accepted that the law of exchange is the law within which we're going to discuss. And it is within the law of exchanges that equal rights can be defined and about which class struggle can unfold. So in a sense he's limited his argument to a world in which the law of exchanges hold and hold good, and in so doing he's ended up with this Magna Carta kind of position. Now how do we respond to it? My own, my own view is that, yes, I think a lot of worker organization, trade union activity, pressures and so on, has often played a very significant role in stabilizing an inherently unstable capitalist system. And that struggles over the length of the working day, which are central in that, are a part of that stabilization. Stabilization for all sorts of social, political, economic reasons. But there is also a point at which the struggle over the length of the working day can start actually to move into a revolutionary mo mode. In other words, you can imagine, well, okay, we have a ten-hour working day, <coughs> but we reduce it to eight hours. The French reduced uh, their working week to, what, thirty-five hours? They're now pushing it in the other direction. But what if you reduce the working week to five hours? You know. in, other, in other words, when you push that this theme of limiting the length of the working day, you can push it to a point where it really s severely impedes the accumulation of capital. So you can move, if you like, from what we would consider to be a reformist view of it, which is a stabilizing form of it, into a revolutionary mode of it when you got it to 35 hours a week, why don't we go to 30 hours a week? And of course one of the responses on the part of capital, if they've got faced with that, would be, as Marx points out in here, what happened as they reduced the length of the working day was the capitalists started to in increase the intensity of labor. That is, you, you can't keep people working for twelve hours or something like that at the same intensity, but if they're only employed for six you can work them extremely intensely and probably get as much labor out of them in six as you might have otherwise got out had they done nine. So the intensity issue becomes rather significant. And there was a wonderful moment when this happened actually in British history, during the first minor strike against uh, uh, Edward Heath's Conservative government back in 1974, 1973-4. Uh, Edward Heath uh, basically proclaimed a lockout, and then he did a terrible thing. That is, he decided they would save electricity, and they would save it by closing all the factories down except for three days a week. So everybody went on a three-day week. Then he made a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake, which was to say the electricity was going to be cut off at ten o'clock at night and you couldn't watch television. And the whole populace threw him out of government with, you know, a few years later. The irony about that was, by the way, the birth rate went up very significantly <laughs> some, some considerable, you know, nine months later, um, after this period when nobody could watch television at night. So, so this, this dynamic, however, is, is kind of an interesting kind of, kind of question about how revolutionary is this struggle about the length of the working day? And like I say, I think is a, there's a stabilizing side of it, a reformist side of it, but then there's also a radicalizing side of it when you, when you really start to, to push it further. But again, capitalists have all kinds of responses in terms of productivity, intensity, and the like, so again you have to watch out for what those responses uh, might be. So let's stop here for a little bit and talk about anything that's animated you or questions you've got about this chapter. It's a long empirical chapter, different in style, historical,
Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I don't think uh, regulating rather fiercely in the name of climate change is going to cause the end of capitalism. There will be rapid ad adaptations. Uh, the problem is that there are certain sectors of the economy that will boom, and certain interests that will boom. And but again, you've got an alliance of forces. And again, I think the way you would analyze it is very much in terms of Marx's kind of way of looking at it, kind of saying what are the class interests behind, you know, why Bush is refusing to do anything. Uh, significant about it, but then there are class forces even about the responses. I mean, carbon trading is a ridiculous idea, creating a market out of that. But, you know, that's where we're headed for ideological reasons. So the big question is why do the Clintonites and everybody else agree that the market solution is the only one which is, which is possible? Uh, and that may actually lead us into other kinds of disasters, which, which uh, you know. So, the, again, the way we would analyze something like that, if you come out of this kind of way of thinking, is, is, to, is to start to sort of build where, where the alliance is and who's pushing what and how is it working. I mean, that's the, way, the mode of analysis. And Marx is a pretty good. I mean, I think, for instance, this chapter on the working day and the, and the 18th Brumaire and some of the studies on class struggles in France are really terrific pioneering pieces on how to do, if you like, a class analysis of a historical dynamic. And they're very well worth you know, worthwhile reading, just simply because uh, they do that and they allow us to see. But then you also notice, and this is something I've emphasized before, the fluidity of the response of capital when faced with these. In this case, not it's not a, 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 a sort of environmental problem; it's a social problem, and the fluidity of their response is at some point or other to give and then then claim. They were the ones who, uh, who, who, who were in for it, who, who agreed with it all along, and they were the ones who created this all along, and aren't they the good people? I mean, we see plenty of that with corporate responsibility on the environment going on right now, you know. Beyond, you know, beyond petroleum, once BP, still BP, but, you know, they try to, and they make a nice green logo and all that kind of stuff. So it's, so it's, uh, it, it's, the, it, it's the framework of analysis, I think, which is really interesting here. And of course, much of this doesn't fit in the sense of the theoretical categories we've got, apart from this connectivity between time control and socially necessary labor time as being the core of what value is about. And there you do see a strong connectivity between what Marx is almost bound to look at, given the nature of that theoretical, uh, that theoretical beginning. Yeah. Are we talking about just then, that with this line of thinking about People have to struggle towards expropriation of private private property, the eradication of private property, right now in this moment. Or is there a way to use the this human rights framework in, in a way that that pushes the way the struggle did with the the working day, or, and, and then and then keep pushing? Or is it is, or is there something else that happens more radically? I mean, what what exactly would Marx say about something like that? that that's well, you have two ways in which you can approach something like the housing question. That is that. Uh, you go and you earn a wage, and, and, and your wage is then applied to living in, in housing, and that is, as it were, how the market works. Or you can have a collective struggle around social housing and, and, and say, you know, we have to put a floor around this. The same would be true of health care or education or any of these areas. That actually all of these, this is the thing, again, none of those things are automatically delivered through the market. Uh, and, and what Marx is drawing attention to here is that all the time you remain just, and this is what neoliberalism is about, it says you are personally responsible for the education, you're personally responsible for uh, health care and your housing, that kind of stuff, it's a personal responsibility system. Whereas what, what Marx would argue is uh, if you are in that system, you are likely to get shafted, you're likely to get very little because the amount of wages you've got are not going to be adequate uh, to purchase you whatever you need 
and then after that come the band-aid solutions. Well, what do we do with all those poor people? Well, okay, we have Medicaid or something like that, or okay, we'll have housing vouchers, or we have education vouchers, or something of that kind. So you start to mess around a bit with the market. Whereas the socialized solution in, say, Scandinavia and so on was, well, we have a class struggle, and we actually build socialized housing, and we just go live in it, you know, and we live in it at, a, at, 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 at minimum cost, you know. So, I mean, Marx would say there's, a, there's an analogy, if you like, between his argument about struggle over the length of the working day over, in effect, the struggle over what is a real wage. And the real wage can be two, one two ways. That is, you can raise your individual wages and then go out and put, spend it on what you like, or you can get a real wage by, by, by this social, social action. Yeah, and, and this again comes back to the civilizational element which is in the, in the situation. But isn't that reformist? Yes, well, it can, it, well again, it can be reformist, but then it can go further. I mean, in effect, you have to ask yourself the question. In the 1950s and 1960s, the welfare states of Europe and even the expanded welfare system that was structured, being structured in this country in terms of anti-poverty programs and all the rest of it, did a tremendous job in stabilizing the economy. It played a, a tremendous role in actually the rapid growth of these economies. So it's totally untrue to say that the development of a welfare state is antagonistic to economic growth. In fact, the rate of economic growth was very strong in the 1950s and 1960s when you have a maximum investment going collectively into these public forms of expenditures. You then get the counterattack, which had nothing to do with growth, had everything to do with class power which then counterattacks that and says, well, you have to go now to this private, uh, private responsibility system. And that, of course, has been going on for the last 30 years, even putting pressure. And again, it, the, 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 the question is, why is there not a, a stronger class force to resist it? And part of that comes back from the fact that the working class has been dismembered in this country by you know, the movement to China and all the rest of it, and the deindustrialization and attacks upon union power and all the rest of it. And this has gone on in Europe as well. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of class struggle and class dynamics. And, and again, who, who, ha, who are the allies? And it's clear that there's a coalition, if you like, of allies which are around this idea that the market is the way in which we should go. But the market has not delivered growth, and certainly it's made conditions worse off for a large chunk of the, of the world's population. But it's made it much, much better off in terms of accumulation of capital, which is, of course, what Marx is saying capitalists are committed to doing. They want to maximize their extraction of surplus value. That's what they're doing, as much as they can. We have five minutes. I just want to do the next chapter, okay? <laughs> the next chapter is, is a, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend much time on it. It's, it's, it's a transitional chapter. Marx does what he usually does. He says, okay, there's the rate of surplus value, and there's a the number of laborers you employ, or the variable capital you invest. Therefore, the mass of capital depends upon the rate of surplus value times the number of laborers you employ. If you re reduce the rate of surplus value, you can compensate by increasing the number of laborers. If you reduce the number of laborers, you can so compensate by increasing the rate of exploitation. Okay? Now, capitalists, he's here pointing out, and this is a significant transition, are interested in the mass of surplus value. Why? Because the mass of surplus value is social power. And the mass of surplus value means that you're always thinking as a capitalist about how many laborers I employ and what the rate of exploitation is. But then he introduces the idea of there are limits. And this is why this chapter is transitional. There's a limit to the rate of surplus value, which we've discussed. Social and physical. I mean, if I reduce my labor to one and I try to increase the rate of surplus value to 5,000 percent, I'll never make it. You know, you just can't do it that way. So there's a limit to that. There's then a limit to the amount of capital you can invest in variable capital. And when you aggregate this up to the total population and, and everything else, what you see is there's a limit to the number of laborers you employ, which is the total population of available laborers. So we end up in this chapter with this idea that there are these two limits to capital accumulation. Total population 
rate of exploitation, and another limit internal to capital, which is the amount which can be spent on variable capital. But capitalism does not like limits. And by definition, they're looking for limitless ways to accumulate. So you have here a contradiction. How do you have a limitless way of accumulating in the face of these limits? And that's the question which then gets posed, which is going to be answered in the next chapter, which says, well, there's another way of gaining surplus value. It's not absolute surplus value, it's relative surplus value. So next week then we're going to read chapter 12 on relative surplus value. This is a th an intense theoretical chapter, you have to read it very closely and get it right. Very easy to get it wrong, and a lot of people don't get it. In very it's not too hard when you get it, but getting it is sometimes hard. And then we're going to read the chapter on cooperation and the chapter on division of labour. So 12, 13 and 14, okay, for next, for next time.